appreciate everyone being here today. Hopefully everybody is uh, staying safe and healthy during these interesting times. Today, uh, we're gonna take an overview of thermal flow technology and uh, the basics of it, applications. Hold on a second here. You're best just sitting a page down, Mark? Yeah, I know, I, I am, I'm on it. Okay. This thing is... Uh... Go to meeting is frozen on me, Chris. Click on your click on your PowerPoint and then try hitting the page down. I have. Mm. So while Art is working on this, I just want to mention to everyone uh, that we are going to offer PDH credit hours for this for PEs. Um, if you would like that, please give me your uh, name and PE number email address in the chat. Art, are you good? Yeah, let's see if we're functioning now. So again, when we, when we look at instrumentation, I think this quote kind of sums it up nicely is, you know, for what we're trying to accomplish with our measurements, we really just want stuff that works. So, you know, the key to that is understanding the technology, how best to apply it. So with thermal technology, you know, it's been around for over 50 years now. So, you know, it's not that it's not a proven technology in any way, it's well proven, you know, we just have to understand it, make sure we, know the advantages, disadvantages, just like any technology we deal with. So with that, by understanding it, properly apply it, we get away from this, you know, still kind of exists black box, you know, concept of thermal products. So with that, you know, let's look at the basics. You know, a thermal sensor, just the sensor itself is composed of, you know, two components, say, and they're sheathed RTDs in most cases, a lot of times fully welded. You know, this is a non-moving part technology. You know, you can see here, uh, you know, again, just two RTDs fully sheathed, a couple different styles of the type of product. So, Thermal is essentially creating a temperature differential. So you think delta T a lot of times. We have a heated sensor where we're generating, you know, putting current into either a heater or a self-heated RTD, comparing that to an unheated sensor and looking at that temperature differential. And from that differential, you start thinking about the cooling effects of the sensor. You know, we're looking at how that cooling is related to the velocity, density, thermal properties of a any type of media, you know, whether it be a, a liquid or a gas. And, you know, velocity, thermal conductivity, that all plays into that cooling. So where things kind of started in the thermal switch side of things, you know, we're really looking at liquid and gas type applications, you know, and, and true benefits are this very low flow capability, you know, being in that 0 0.1 to 5 foot per second for liquids, gas has a much broader range. You know, when you look at even liquids, now the range is going to vary. If you look here below at water-based versus hydrocarbon, you know, there's a slight difference in range and that's really related to that cooling effect of the liquid itself. You know, and you can see that it's quite lower than that of gases. When we go to the right-hand side, again, just to illustrate that difference, if you look at a 
flow curve for, for a water media versus that of oil, it varies quite a bit. And a lot of that is due to that thermal conductivity. And this is key because a lot of times you're dealing with a constant liquid. Uh, if you're doing a flow switch application, maybe you're monitoring the pump of a vessel. Um, sometimes you might be dealing with aqueous solutions. And an area to keep in mind is if that percent concentration changes, you know, that thermal conductivity is going to affect that curve. So in those cases, you might look more for a flow, no flow type application than trying to hit a very specific value because if you calibrate for one solution and then change that solution by, you know, five, 10 percent, it's going to trip at a slightly different value. So, you know, the cooling effect of the media does play a, a role here. So from a switch, you know, very positive attributes available with it. Um, one of the biggest one is going to be your reliability, no moving parts. Um, the other thing you look at compared to other devices like a mechanical device, a vein type switch, is it's very flexible in its orientation. It's easier on, and simpler on its installation. There's no veins to make sure they're moving freely. I don't have to have an, a proper up down or you know, pay attention to whether I've got a vertical down or up flow. The sensor can literally be mounted on any orientation of the pipe. You know, the other area is being able to verify it simply in the field. You know, you don't have to cycle the process to see that it's working. There's checks that can be done on electronics and sensors. And, you know, we're looking at industrialized products for the, in, you know, process industry. So this technology, a lot of times in the industrial side, it'll carry the hazardous area ratings some uh, safety instrument and system compliance, and it's also been used effectively in the nuclear world. Now let's change over to the metering side. Specifically, we're gonna talk about mass flow metering. And within the industry, there's two recognized and accepted technologies, thermal being one of those, you know, Coriolis for many medias, thermal really being focused on gases, and we'll get into that reason why. Um, you know, they're mass flow because neither one of these, you know, requires that secondary pressure temperature compensation to take a volumetric reading to mass flow. So, simplifies things. So, when you look at a gas, you know, compared to a, a liquid, you know, in our previous slides, that liquid was limited to about five feet per second as a maximum velocity. With gases, with that smaller cooling effect, just due to the, you know, thermal conductivity, we're able to get ranges much higher. You know, we're looking at ranges in the you know, roughly 200 actual feet per second that now equate to calibrations in that 600 to 1,000 range. And one area that really benefits from thermal is being able to go very low in flow that you don't get from a lot of devices. That quarter foot per second is, is barely moving flow. Taking a look at a very simplified mass flow equation for thermal technology and really hitting on the areas that are key to, you know, the proper calibration, you know, making sure we're accurate in our reading is the mass flow is proportional to the temperature change between that sensor. You know, the things that really impact that are density. So gas composition is going to be one area. You know, um, the nice thing about density is pressure temperature changes. It's accounted for in that density value. So again, no need for pressure and temperature compensation, separate instruments. The other area that we look at is, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at the velocity. 
So between the density and the area of the pipe or duct that we're measuring, we can come up with that mass flow calibration, you know, and by taking those things to account, you know, your process conditions, your your temperatures, pressures, flow range, and your gas composition, you know, these meters can be accurately calibrated on a flow stand. So they're installed and, you know, no additional work is needed on the part of the customer. Another area to understand is there's a couple different ways to power that sensor. You know, we look at, you know, the current being introduced to create that temperature differential. So one way is constant power, a fixed current, um, creating a temperature differential. Then we measure that change in the differential. You know, it's, it's a very passive design. You know, it gives up some response time, but it also doesn't have, you know, a lot of false high readings, um, you know, due to things like condensation or entrained moisture that might temporarily cool that heated RTD. So that passive circuit just kind of naturally damps it. On the constant temperature side, you know, it's exactly that. Um, now we're creating a temperature differential and we continue to put current into that heater to maintain that temperature differential. That's proportional to our mass flow rate you know, benefit of that constant temperature design again is if I've got a process like a test stand, something where I need to have a very fast response time, CT, you know, gives you that capability. The other thing to look at is there are some newer hybrid sensor designs on the market that really combine the benefits of those two, the ability to, you know, be in that constant power mode, get some broader flow ranges, as well as get the response time of a constant temperature device. And this next slide here kind of shows some of that relationship between it. First over here, we have constant power where we're putting a fixed current into the heater. And as flow increases, you see the delta T change. And again, that delta T is able to go out a little bit further in our measurements, you know, up to a thousand standard feet per second. On the other side of it, you know, our constant temperature, now we're maintaining that temperature differential and we're putting current into it in relationship to the flow. So again, there's some potential limits on your high end flow rate capability. The other thing is, is that you typically want to limit the amount of current going into that sensor so you're not pre-aging sensors, you know, which would lead to potential drift and failure. Big question that comes up often since we're basically heating an RTD is whether these devices are, are suitable for explosive type gases and gas compositions. And, you know, the answer to that is a resounding yes. You know, um, even though we're putting heat into that process, it's still a small amount. And if you look in the case here, you know, from the standpoint of temperature differentials, a constant power device is only introduced at about 26 to 30 degrees temperature differential where the CT and the hybrid type sensors are in that five to 10 range. So we're not looking at a large amount of heat. You know, the technology has been used, you know, successfully for years in natural gas, um, landfill, digester gas, uh, flare applications, you know, even oxygen. So it's suitable for these environments because, you know, the other side of it is a small heat source, plus in a lot of cases, you've got that lack of oxygen. You don't create the conditions in a lot of cases that would ever lead to an explosive type situation. And to represent that suitability, you know, many, you know, most manufacturers have approvals that you know, not only from the external side, the enclosure side where it's suitable for hazardous areas, but, you know, those will commonly include the ratings for, you know, the environment, the maximum temperatures, 
of a process that this type of technology should be used in. So it, it, you do have that limit and that information available to you. So I guess, quick question for you, Matt, any questions we wanna address at this time? There's been one that um, I think I it, it generally can um, kind of ask is, is um, orientation of the meter in the pipe, and, and maybe you're going there now. Um, does it matter uh, as far as for reverse flow, forward flow, what the orientation of the probe is in the pipe? Um, the orientation of the probe, there's a couple things to address there. One, you know, is, is just where it is on the pipe, and the other is the flow direction. Um, you know, with these sensors, you're commonly trying to balance the mass between the heated and the unheated RTD, so it's very uniform. But, you know, each one of these sensors has its own little individual fingerprint, and when you calibrate it on a stand, you know, there's a flow direction put onto the flow element. And that would be the desired orientation of the, the flow sensor itself. Um, if you reverse it, is it not going to work? No, it's, it's going to continue to work. But you just might want to recognize that there might be some slight errors introduced due to these individual fingerprints, uh, you know, slight variations in mass. I mean, we do everything we can as a manufacturer to keep that mass equal, but, you know, there are slight variations. And when it comes to actual orientation for a process and what might be the best installation area on a pipe, we'll cover that here in a little bit. Hopefully that answers the question there. Thanks, Art. That's it for questions for now. Okay. So looking at going further into the sensors, there's two types of designs you'll commonly see with thermal technology. Um, one of them is a inline or a spool type design. This is predominantly used, you know, in very small line sizes because what you get with that, if you go with an insertion style is, you know, the positioning of the sensor being installed properly in such a small line size, as well as rotational effects, like if you're, you know, two to five degrees off perpendicular, those things introduce errors. So by making these spool pieces, calibrating the entire spool piece, you know, manufacturers are basically ensuring that when you take it out of the box, install it in your process, there are no orientation issues that can impact the reading. You know, the other thing you get into is this sensor pocket. So now you've I've got a small line and I use a traditional insertion style. I've got some, you know, constraints and I start really blocking the flow area of that pipe. So you'll see some special design differences in that inline piece compared to an insertion style. So the other side of it now, when you, you know, common in two and a half larger lines, again, what we refer to as an insertion design, uh, we touched on it, there's fewer errors due to being a little bit off in your depth and rotational effects. The, the value here is this is what makes the product a very economical solution for gas flow measurements. You know, you, you only have one insertion point, you know, which is basically either a thread outlet or a half coupling, maybe a flange port mounted onto your process pipe. There's no additional you know, hardware avail required. There's no additional uh, tubing um, valves or anything. When you're dealing with your manufacturers, the other thing you should look at is, is sensor styles. There's been a lot of work, because again, this technology has been around since the 80s, coming up with sensor designs really optimized for specific gas applications, you know, some are suited to higher pressures, compressed gas applications, you know, others more for corrosive media, 
And then, you know, there's some newer designs that help handle wet gas type applications. So, you know, working with your manufacturer, knowing your application, you know, selection of that sensor, you know, could optimize your installations. Key area also with the thermal sensor, since there's no moving parts and everything, no ports, is this technology is very well suited for gas strings with particulate, you know. Um, as you can see in this drawing to the left here, you know, we've got a particulate that actually is, is coating to some extent. Uh, you know, this coating is going to over time affect your accuracy but you know it's not going to stop the meter from working entirely you know it's still going to give you a reading um you know based on the site location the amount of buildup just can easily be resolved with preventive maintenance you know extracting it from the process and just cleaning the sensor you know on the right hand side is kind of an area where you see commonly with uh, power plants larger boiler secondary primary air where you've got some dust weight and airflow coming into it well you you know the sensors themselves are very clean there's nothing building up on it you know since it's still a relatively dry gas and regardless of the particulate in the gas stream you're getting a very accurate repeatable reading Another key area is turndown. Um, when you speak of benefits of thermal technology for your mass flow measurements of gases, you know, turndown ratio is is a huge benefit, you know, typically 100 to 1. You know, in this example, you know, if we're measuring natural gas, you know, a thermal meter can get down much slower than, say, a DP in an orifice device with a 5 to 1 turndown. Um, even if you go to a vortex type meter with a little bit broader turn down, you're still limited. And areas where we've seen this come into play is boilers, um, you know, burners, flares, where you have a potentially low flow pilot condition when the equipment's not operating. And then when it turns on, it goes to a very high flow rate. Thermal technology, when properly sized for your line, captures both of those conditions you know um, there have been instances where we've replaced both technologies because for the line size the turn down did not capture that low flow here's an area that really is key to understand is is actual gas conditions actual gas compositions um, one area that the thermal calibration is based off of as a known or a baseline gas composition. You know, from that, you can calibrate the instrument. But if you see here in this table, you know, if we calibrated a meter for air, the effects, the cooling differences of different gases is easily noticed. So if we take that same meter calibrated for air and put it in the butane, you know, it's a slightly less linear response because it's not calibrated for that gas we're doing just a reading there and you've kind of limited your your uh, flow range you know it's not nearly as high um, going the other direction natural gas is kind of linear but there's a big offset if we don't account for in that calibration uh, same thing with hydrogen limited in flow very large offset so with that, as a manufacturer, knowing that gas composition, you know, we try to get away from doing air equivalencies, which is a theoretical adjustment to make that an accurate reading for a different gas. You know, as much as possible, we like to calibrate in the media that best matches your gas composition to give you the most accurate results. And that's based on composition as well as understanding your pressure temperature capability you know conditions because that'll all come into playing and affecting the velocity range that we're calibrating for 
Now, uh, area of concern always is, hey, if I have a change in gas composition, and without getting into it in detail here, there are ways to address it. You know, it, it's all dependent upon the magnitude of the change in the media involved. Sometimes you can do a linear correction. Other times you might have to look into ways of doing a, maybe a table type correction for multiple situations or you know, some meters have the ability to put multiple curves into them that you can select a curve that best matches your gas composition at the time. So, but a big area to understand is, you know, since we're looking at cooling effects is how well is that meter matched to my actual process conditions? So doing presentations for almost 13 years now on thermal technology, an area we always get involved with is, okay, you know, ideal conditions versus actual field conditions. Um, you know, as much as we'd like, you know, to have all the straight run in the world we need, you know, that's not always the case. You know, maybe we're selecting a, a site location after the process piping's in place, a measurement is decided to be made, you know, how do we best achieve it? When you look at any type of single point measuring device, whether it be thermal, turbine, you know, vortex, others of that nature, we're really looking at fully developed flow profiles. So when we're calibrating in, a, in our Cal lab, you know, we're creating those developed flow profiles you know, whether it be turbulent or laminar, or in some cases as your ducts or pipes get long enough, it starts getting to be more of a flat shape. So our recommendation for almost as long as we've been doing meters is kind of geared towards the AGA side of things, which is 20 diameters up, 10 diameters down, really ensures that develop flow profile from any obstructions that might be upstream or downstream of the metering point. But in reality, uh, that's not going to always be the case, you know, especially when you get in the larger line size that take up a lot of real estate. So one of the areas uh, you can look at is, you know, what's the obstruction? How many diameters is it from my meter location? And what impact does it have on accuracy? So if you look at this chart here, you know, we're talking about elbows um, up and down, or maybe, you know, two elbows and series and a gate valve is just some quick examples. The red doesn't indicate that it's a bad application. The red just indicates that, hey, now I'm looking at an inaccuracy greater than 5%. So evaluating impact on straight run, that's always the number one question that we have is, you know, what's the accuracy? What What's the desired accuracy you're trying to achieve? And, you know, what kind of solutions do we take to get there? But before you can take that next step, you really have to understand what inaccuracies are being introduced. Which most often leads to when you, you've got these bad conditions, you know, lack of straight run, uh, gate valves upstream or butterfly valves upstream that are creating varying flow profiles. Typical solution is going to be applying some type of conditioner, you know, and when you look at that selection, you, you've also got to take into consideration that not all conditioners are producing the same results, you know. If you look at this graph on the right, you know, just permanent pressure loss alone varies greatly from one design to another. Um, you know, when you look at the types, you know, some are good at, you know, correcting velocity profile distortions. Others are good at correcting swirling conditions of my gas due to elbows out of planes or other devices. But, you know, are they all good at taking care of both? You know, you really got to understand the condition in your piping that you're trying to address. And the the big area where thermal manufacturers try to really help out here is 
calibrating a meter specifically to that new flow profile. Because even with a short distance between the conditioner and the meter, you're not creating a fully laminar or turbulent flow profile again. You're just creating a very repeatable condition. So if you just put the conditioner in by itself, there's still going to be some inaccuracy associated with it. So the value is making sure that meter is calibrated to that new flow profile. So where are we at, Matt? Yeah, our, we have a couple questions here. Um, and I think okay. We have well, a few questions here. Um, so one, and it looks like you might be getting ready to cover this, is do you aim for the center of the pipe for the insertion into the pipe? Um, the answer is yes and yes. Yes, we're going to cover it. But um, yeah, in a lot of cases, a manufacturer is looking at measuring the maximum velocity point of a fully developed flow profile. So typically, you're looking for center line of the pipe. Now, when you get into devices, maybe like a multi-point configuration, now you're looking at breaking it up into smaller cross-sectional areas. You're not always going to the center of the pipe. So, you know, size of it takes into account as well. If I've got a very large duct, you know, fairly, you know, good amount of straight run, and I've got a fully developed flow profile, that profile is pretty flat across the uh, the front of it. So being off center there really doesn't introduce a lot of error. It's more of, you know, error due to having a single point measurement in such a large cross-sectional area. Thanks, Art. Uh, another question here is, can I use one meter that can have, um, say, two different gases flowing through the same pipe, um, one at a time, let's say argon and then hydrogen? Um, can it can it read both of those with a single meter? Um, yeah, you, you can do both of those with a single meter. The the question is again, you know, what level of accuracy do you, do you want? Because if you're primarily running one gas, you know, and you use that as your baseline, and then in a secondary condition you're running, you know, a different gas, you might consider that linear correction factor. You know, and that can be applied at the meter or your PLC or DCS, right? And that would just linear correct for those differences in the properties. Not as accurate as the, you know, true calibration for that gas. The other option, again, is there's meters on the market that allow you to put in more than one calibration group. And with that calibrate, you know, multiple calibration group set up, Commonly, you have an analog input that if you know which gas you're flowing at a time, by changing the analog signal to the meter, it could read one of two or more curves based on, you know, that input. So there's different ways to approach that. Thanks, Art. And uh, got a couple uh, applications in wastewater plants, I'm um, wondering about this meter one is uh for uh digester gas is this a suitable meter for digester gas um digester gas yes it is a suitable meter for that if we understand the conditions um you know going back to the 80s 90s our technology has been used in digester gas applications so it's not uncommon um you know with digester gas though you've got a couple of things to consider is you know, is there a large variation between the gas composition over time? And a lot of times it's a moist application where you have condensation on the wall of the pipe, maybe some entrained moisture that needs to be accounted for. And we'll look at addressing that here further on into the presentation. Thanks, Art. And uh, last question, again, wastewater plant um, for blowers on aeration basins. Our blowers on aeration basins again um you know one of our when you look at the municipal market specifically the wastewater treatment market, um you know 
the, the number one and two applications are aeration, you know, measuring, you know, output from your blowers on main headers, measuring down to each of the drop legs for your airflow. And the second one is your, you know, digest or gas application, you know, a third being odor control. Um, you know, forgot to mention on the digester gas, uh, the other area you get into is a lot of times you get to some very low flow conditions and that's where that quarter foot per second capability comes into play. On aeration, you know, again, the big benefit there is the mass flow because, you know, it's not just a volumetric flow rate so you can truly understand the mass, the amount of air going into the process. Um, the other area is turn down again. You know, if you go with a differential type device, you know, you might, you know, get 10 to one with some of the higher end meters. Typically you're five to one. Now we can measure a much broader change and be accurate across that whole reading. Hopefully that answers those questions. Thank you, Art. That's all the questions for now. Okay. Thank you. So getting into installation, you know, maintenance and operation, you know, the question that was asked previously is, is where are you looking to install, a, you know, a thermal meter? Um, you know, depending upon the line size, you know, up until probably about 20 inches or so, you know, get large in accuracy. So the single point meter is a good way to go. And again, we're looking in a lot of cases, we're calibrating to that maximum velocity of a fully developed flow profile. So that's where we do want to be center line. And, you know, depending upon the sensor design, the actual physical design of it, it's going to determine where you need to orientate it so you're heated and non-heated RTD are properly centered. You know, so that center line is going to take into account the idea of the pipe, wall thickness, and whether you're using a half coupling thread wet, maybe a standoff with a flange, you know, all these things are going to come into play to make sure we get this insertion length right and we don't come up short of that center line, you know. Sometimes uh, we get going very quickly and we forget, hey, I want to put an isolation ball valve in there. Well, that's going to add about another four to five inches to this dimension right here. And if I, I haven't taken that account on the front end. I've already ordered my instruments. Uh, I don't have that extra space with if I'm, you know, have gone and optimized the length of my insertion meter. Getting to the orientation side of it again with gas flow, um, you know, anywhere around the pipe is suitable. You know, a lot of times access doesn't allow you to be top mounted, um, you know, Sometimes it's better to come in from the side or the bottom, but it, it's there. There's nothing that limits us going around the circumference of the pipe or duct. It's really just making sure we have the ability to get to the center line and you have the clearance to install the meter. Of course, with that said, you know, one of the areas we've got to look at now is, is what we call wet gases, what a lot of people would consider wet gases. Now we're talking again, our digester, biogas, uh, maybe some off gas processes from, uh, that include a, a certain amount of water vapor, even moisture content. And this is challenging for a thermal device because that moisture is going to act as a much greater cooling effect than the gas. So a lot of times you might see, you know, false high readings related to this. Um, you know, so the question is, how do we address this? Does this make it where thermal is not suited? No. Again, it comes down to really understanding the application. You know, um, a lot of times you prefer that gas to be conditioned before your metering point. But due to a location choice or just the cost of drying or cleaning that gas, it's just not feasible. So, you know, we just need to understand what we're dealing with, whether it's in train moisture in the gas stream, um, you know, even on stacks, a very large stack, you might have your vertical upflow, but during the rainy season, you get a lot of moisture coming in down from above, you know, that can impact that stack measurement. 
um, you know, and then condensation itself, you know, forget about entrain moisture of any type, but just condensation on the wall of pipe, what's it gonna do to uh, potentially do to my reading? So when you look at that, there are some recommendations when you think you have this potential or you've seen, you know, cooling effects taking place with your process, you know, you actually open up the pipe, you can see water draining out of it. You know, there might be some thought going into the orientation of the sensor. Now here, you know, the area that I'd probably least want to mount that flow element is the top of the pipe, you know, because that seems to be the common area because it's on the top. I can have my display. Everything's facing me. Life is good. But from a moisture standpoint, all we've done is created a path, especially if we've got condensation on the wall or it might form on the extension of the flow element. We've just given it a path to flow down and cool that sensor. So when you go into the side of the pipe or even at an angle, now if I get condensation on the wall of the pipe, I get condensation on the extension, it's all gonna flow away from that, that sensor itself and minimize the potential for um, that cooling effect. And again, you know, that coupled with whether I'm using constant power or constant temperature technology can make a difference as well. Because that constant power being, you know, more passive, not effective as quickly and as much by the cooling effect of a moisture versus constant temperature. The other thing you've seen come onto the marketplace in these last few years are some newer special purpose flow meters for wet gases. And there's a couple of ways to approach that. One is just a mechanical approach, which is just keeping the water, the moisture from getting to the sensor in the first place. The other one is a temperature approach, which is let's really create a large temperature differential in this process and make sure the moisture doesn't affect that reading because it tends to flash off. You know, and each one of them kind of has its merits, but from a standpoint of, you know, use in different gases, um, the potential for pre-aging a sensor, so the failure may, you know, the instrument may have a shorter lifetime than expected. You know, the mechanical device just provides more of a, you know, what you're used to seeing type approach to things. You know, and, and again, both of those have their merits. You know, the key thing here is we still got to watch that we're talking about a wet gas, not a dual phase application, because regardless of the technology, if you put too much liquid into a gas stream, the thermal is going to eventually be overcome by the, that that moisture. And just to give you an example here, short video here of, of what we're looking at. So before we started up, we had an airflow of about 570 SCFM going through here. And as you can see through the bubbler and a mister, you know, as we introduce some moisture into there, we see a little bit of a cooling effect. You know, we see that going down, but it's not going down a lot, you know. So with this, you know, traditionally you're introducing that moisture, you'd see a, a lot of spikes in your process, but this, this mechanical shield tends to eliminate that and gives you a constant steady reading, even with that moisture being introduced into the gas stream. Just another indication of what we're talking about here. Um, so again, we've got a gas at a steady flow rate, and now, we, you know, we've introduced moisture content to it. And when we expect the steady flow rate to take place with a, without that, some kind of mechanical approach to it, you can see over time, 
that entrained moisture is just going to create this very false high reading. I mean, it will look like the meter's pegged, you know. But when you look at that same condition with the mechanical shield, you know, we don't get that false high reading. And actually what we get is a little bit of a drop off because now that, you know, we've eliminated all, you know, that, that moisture in the stream, um, we're knocking that out. There is still a little bit of a cooling or not a cooling effect, but, you know, just a little bit of drop due to a change in the gas composition. Other things you look for when it comes to maintenance nowadays and, and verification of a meter, because validation and verification of any technology is always first and foremost at everybody's mind when it comes to maintenance and, you know, how well is my meter still working in my application? You know, has the accuracy been impacted? Well, first off, without putting any technology on a flow stand, it's very difficult to truly validate that meter, you know, unless you have a primary sensor or some type of device that's going to really allow you to verify the accuracy compared to a standard. But what you have a lot of days now, and almost every manufacturer's gone to it, is some kind of self-check in the electronics themselves. And essentially what you're doing is you're either bypassing the sensor itself and, you know, reading some precision resistors inside the device or you're bypassing the sensor and feeding back your current information to make sure essentially that your your analog to digital converter is reading correctly and I'm getting the input that I'm expecting. Um, very critical because with a thermal type product since the sensor is so simple you know RTDs heaters you know really the main thing is has the wiring or the RTD, anything open or short circuited in that sensor, that sensor is the most reliable part of the instrument. You know, the the key is, do I have a way of checking that? It's, you know, the electronics themselves to make sure I have no issues there. Because if you have something with the sensor, internal diagnostics are going to detect that it's outside of the expected range for a calibration, the input, or it's going to detect shorts or open circuits in any of those components. So sensor checks are, are more common nowadays. Another area we look at is, is you know, given the benefits of the technology, you know, where, you know, why, why are people other than the understanding, the experience, you know, why is differential pressure with the orifice still used? You know, you've got a lot more components to that installation. You know, you've got your sensor, you know, your transmitter, manifolds, impulse tubing, the orifice itself, you know, there's things in that configuration that, you know, really have to be paid attention to from an installed point. Um, permanent pressure loss is an area that you look at, you know, an orifice compared to an insertion type meter can be you know, almost three to four times higher in permanent pressure loss for a lot of applications, you know. Uh, one of the areas that we always hear about when it comes to, again, validation and calibration of a DP type reading versus a thermal is, hey, I can take that DP transmitter, I can calibrate it on the bench, and, you know, it, it's something I can rely on. Well, you know, if you're truly looking at mass flow, you know, you also have to calibrate the pressure temperature device. You know, you also have not taken into account any leaks, impulse tubing manifold valves. And the other key critical area is removing that orifice so you can actually, you know, verify the edge that is free from debris, things of that nature. So to the right here is an example, again, of 
even if I put in an isolation valve, you know, on a hot tap to be put onto a process, the ball valve, you know, full port ball valve being installed on it, I can now insert and extract under operating conditions that instrument. Um, you know, between it being mass flow, you know, we talk about turn down, um, pressure loss, all things that are, you know, in some cases easily measured, you know, measurable. Um, the installation side of it, you know, and we do recognize that you, you've got to pay attention to your gas condition. You got to pay attention to, you know, changing gas compositions, whether it's clean, dirty, wet. Um, you know, and again, the big thing about this technology is it's really only suitable for gas applications. But when you look at gas applications, there's a, you know, a lot of value added to considering this technology. One area we looked at is cost of ownership. You know, and this is just an example. Your cost may vary, you know, you can use it as a model. Um, we've eliminated common things like, you know, loops, um, you know, inputs to PLCs, cable, conduit, really looking at the differences in them. And you can see, you know, by the time you account for the hardware with either a differential pressure or multivariable device um, between tubing, flanges and such, compared to a standoff and an isolation valve, your initial costs are, are, you know, right in there with your DP and orifice or your multivariable with orifice. It's when you get down into the in installation costs and really the the energy loss associated with permanent pressure loss across the sensor, you know, whether it be the orifice or the thermal device, that's where you start seeing your larger savings, you know. So when you look at cost of ownership, don't forget to take into account the energy loss associated with the measurement. And finally, one other area to address larger line sizes or less than ideal straight run, um, you know, few manufacturers have what is considered a multi-point averaging configuration. And what you have, again, is, is when you get into large diameters, you know, we're talking maybe four by eight feet, you know, larger pipe sizes, 40 or larger, you start getting some significant inaccuracies by having that single point measurement in the center. So one thing we look at kind of similar to an averaging pitot tube is let's put more points into the process, break up that cross-sectional area, and then average them into one single flow reading. And, you know, your, your duct size, your, your orientation, um, you know, that's going to determine, you know, the optimum number of points to give you a very accurate reading. You know, now maybe I take something that had a 10% error with another technology, and by going to this configuration, I can get it down to maybe five or better, you know, with, with taking this averaging approach. You know, another another example of it, again, you might have a couple of points in the meter or you might have, you know, a flow element here that's actually designed to have two or more points on a single bar because depending upon the configuration, I might want to have six points or four points in a straight line. You know, or I may only have access from one side of a duct or a pipe, you know, there's you know, again, we've got to take access into account. And really, when you look at multi-point averaging, you know, you, you got to look at the fact that some of these are created where the averaging of all these multiple points are done in a single set of electronics, whereas other folks might go with multiple sensors that now have to be powered individually, averaged in a flow computer, and then give you that output. So just uh, things to consider in that area as well. And that's kind of the end of the overview today. Matt, 
Where are we at on questions? There are no more questions at the moment. So, okay. if anybody has any, um, we have a few minutes here uh, until three. Again, anybody who may have missed it, if you want a PDH credit hour, um, if you could in the chat real quick before three o'clock, send me your email address, name, and PE number so that I can get you a certificate. Any other questions? We'd be happy to answer those as well in the chat. And again, I appreciate everybody's time today. Um, you know, it's really a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I can only encourage you to reach out, you know, to your sales engineer at Gilson if you've got specific questions on any one area that you'd like more information on, you know, reach out to them and, and get their input, you know, regarding your applications.